Is secure private communication a complete pipe dream? Welcome to Tech First with John Goods here. Jeff Pulver created VoIP, voice over IP, literally. He also founded Vonage, a $3 billion company, and he got the US government to issue the Pulver order, which ensured that voice over IP was not restricted. Now he's reinventing voice, video, and text communication online. The goal? fixing security issues that we've seen with Zoom and other platforms. Jeff, welcome. Thank you for having me. How are you doing? I, I mean, I'm starting all my interviews these days with, you know, how are you doing? Where are you? Are you sheltering in place? Are you safe? Other things like that. I'm sheltering Start in place. Us off with that. I'm on Long Island in, in a hot zone. If, if Perhaps one of the biggest hot zones in America right now. Sheltering in place with my uh, immediate family and um, laying low. And uh, yet at the same time, feeling inspired, I've actually had blockchain dreams of how we can uh, use certain technologies to get out of this mess, uh, which, you know, I, uh, I don't know, I, the, we're in the WTF, what day is it, does it really matter era, I understand that. Uh, and and the, the biggest shocker to some people I've spoken to is they think we're going to go back to the way things were. And the idea is that we're in the now, and, and the now we're in is going to shift to another now, but it won't be the now perhaps they understand. And and I, I've already started doing things in the BC era, that is, the before, in, after. I thought and I was the guy who invented that. AC is after coronavirus, BC is before well, coronavirus. It's BC or BCE, right? Before the corona era, coronavirus era, or after. Right? It's, it's, but we're, not, we're certainly, and when I look at commercials, when I look at um, movies, certainly I, I see things created a certain way. And then I feel like I look at a commercial that's on TV now and it's like, wait, it doesn't belong. It doesn't feel right to see this. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and so, but I, but I've been thinking a lot about how do we get out of this mess? And part of the drop to pause and you figure out how to reinvigorate and restart the economy. One of the biggest things we need to figure out from the very beginning is interoperability. Yeah. Uh, if you remember the nineties with the advent of the internet going from dial up to broadband, there was a time when many of us carried an entire um, bag of tricks so that when we went to one country or another country, we'd be able to yes. connect to the telephone lines. Yes. And then one day Wi-Fi happened and we had interoperability and we actually can use Wi-Fi as a way to connect. And the way I explain that to other people is your bank card, your ATM card for people who went to the bank and you traveled from New York to Toronto and you needed cash, you went to New York to London and you needed you know, some pounds, you can go to a foreign bank and dip the, your card in and you, you got the currency. I understand we're moving to a cashless society, but the interoperability that we have with ATMs is amazing. Yeah. Let's say that we get through this and we, we're testing, we have in-home testing, so we have immediate access and we know ourselves whether or not we have the, you know, we, we can prove that we either uh, virus-free, haven't had it yet, or what our status is. Well, you know, it's interesting you mentioned that because I just posted, you know, I'm working on a book, uh, Insights from the Future, right? Yes. Uh, which is future stuff. And I just posted about a device that I said Apple's going to invent a year from now, which you wear and gets virus updates, much like your antivirus software on your laptop gets virus updates weekly or monthly or something like that. And you just, you know, put a little sample of blood or whatever might be in the case there and you get a little ding and you're you're good or you're right. bad. So we, but we know that we're good, right? But we're going to try, I want to travel from New York to London to attend a conference. Exactly. So, so, so the thing is, my so my municipality, I'll say the county, even New York State, will figure out how to go from place to place within New York State. And knowing Governor Cuomo, who he'll work it out with the governors of New, Jer New Jersey and Connecticut because he always seems to. So we'll have some interoperability state to state. But if I want to fly to California, if I want to go to Vancouver, if I want to go to London. Then we have to, we're talking about on a galactic level, global level, we need interoperability for the test results. Yes. You know, I understand that in some, uh, in at least one Asian country. And verification that you are uh, right. either immune or you're not carrying the disease. Well, and I understand people in, I, I don't know, I read too many reports. I don't know what's true or not, but I understand there are QR codes assigned to people's smartphones. Yes. And, and, and it scans either green, red, and they check your temperature when you enter a location, and it scans green, and then you scan green, red, or yellow. Green, you're fine to go, for at least stay for two hours. Red means you got to go back. You should not be where you are. And yellow, I read different stories, but one is yellow is, if, if, you, if you turn yellow, it means that you've interacted with somebody who's come down with a virus. That's correct. And, and, and well, there's, so, there's, there's management of that all on the back end as well, so it knows who you've been in touch with or who you may right. have been in touch but with. But on a hyper-local basis within that um, uh, dystopian uh, um, government's uh, control, you're good. 
thing is, if you want to go from that dystopian government to another dystopian government's control, you may be out of luck because they have no way to intake you into their system and they have no way to, reason to trust to trust what the results were. So I was that's why I was thinking about blockchain, about if we were to believe in immutable trust and not quantum physics and, 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 and say that we can actually have trusted systems around the world, we need an interoperability at the highest level to roll to to, to unroll this. So too many people are thinking just to themselves or just to their municipality. But if we want to do this right, because we have a global economy, we have to figure this out at the highest level and bring it down. It requires a lot of thinking. It well, we need that, that interoperability that you're talking about. We absolutely need that. We also need some level of doing this in a way that protects personal privacy so that you yes, can know that, that we're going to meet for coffee, that I'm safe and I know that you're safe. But we can exchange that information without releasing too many details to some government or something like Again, that. Again, that's where blockchain could work, where we have immutable trust, where we're sharing very little information actually on the blockchain, but enough information so we know that we both um, that we are both safe to meet with each other. And yes, you know, it's that needs to be solved now. I mean, too many people are are. To, I mean. I, I, I'm not a political person, but too many people are looking to start a, an economy. I understand that if we started too early, if we started too early, we're going to just bring back spikes, which I, I'm seeing the death tolls every day here in New York, and it's not fun. It's so, not fun at all. It's awful. I mean, and they, they talk about the death in home that was about 25 a day in New York um, in normal times and is now uh, something uh, is something like a thousand a week or something like that. I don't have the exact stat, but it's well, horrific. 799 people were reported passing away in the last 24 hours in New York. And so wow. um, it, it's it's a lot and it's very heavy. And you're in a situation where you, you can't be communal. P people are not able to go to funerals and respect those who passed. It's a really hard time. Or hold the hand of their loved one as their loved one passes away. And say goodbye. And say goodbye. Um, so this is the reality that we're in. Uh, I wanted to respect that by starting there, but it's not exactly why we came together to talk. Um, you're doing something interesting. You cannot not do things in communications, apparently. Well, <laughs> this, is, it, this is your world. This is your life. You're reinventing communications uh, across the the your entire lifespan as an entrepreneur. Talk about the problem that you're trying to fix. I mean, we've seen Zoom and we've seen lots of security issues with that as that's 10X, 20X over the past few months. Uh, we've seen lots of security issues with other communications protocols. Talk about the problem you're trying to fix. Uh, well, the, the it's really not a problem trying to fix as much as a solution I'm looking to bring to market. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, during my communication journey, so just go back in time, in 1995, I launched the first phone network on the internet called Free World Dial-Up. It was seven years before Skype. And approved to the world, and it was just a project. It was there was no business plan. We I did it with a couple with the with support of two people, one in Indonesia, another friend in Tokyo and in, in, in Japan, and we created a network, the first one ever, that ever ran on the internet, and it was a precursor to what was going to be in the future. And then, um, and that project evolved. Free World Dial evolved from being having an, a, a telephone line component because it was basically end-to-end -end calling over over local calling using the internet as the intermediary so that if me calling you i could bypass long distance charges and it, what it evolved into was an end-to-end -end ip communication network with no telephone numbers where users could configure their own device and connect and i ended up with over a million users at that point it took it we were that took a while to go there but by uh, 2002 2003 2004 Four, we were about at a million or so, and it was, and it was a large interrupt network because we were open to peering with other networks. So it wasn't just my network, but I could interconnect with your network. And there was a time I was trying to work with MCI when MCI was MCI, and they wanted to charge fees to interconnect with MCI. And I actually had more users on my network than they had on theirs, running, <laughs> running, running the protocol. So we, we worked out a peering relationship. And so, so twenty years later, um, what is needed? And so I've always been an advocate for creating the future, of creating a test bed, and to encourage other people to join that future. And so several years ago, when I started thinking about blockchain, blockchain communications made a lot of sense, particularly on the back end, yes. where people had complaints about billing and creating call detail records and being able to understand timestamps. And there's a lot of reasons why in the back office, a blockchain works just, just to have immutable trust, just to have the trust and the ability to actually have proper billing um, and proper record keeping. So that's there's a need there has been for a long, long time. 
Now you look on the front end, um, what I'm advocating really and what we're creating, again, is a, ne is a next generation end-to-end -end IP network, no telephone numbers needed, right? What we're, we're creating is that middleware. We already have, um, and when, when, you, when you're creating a network, if, I, if, if in 1992, I was telling to tell you about the internet, <laughs> You know, what, what are you going to do with that? You know, because yeah. it's, it's like, sure, you're, you're going to do blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and, and the thing is, the, the best inventions are those that, that, that get into other people's hands, that repurpose it, and all of a sudden create things you never never before were even saw as based on what you were doing. And that's the magic that you created. It's when people stumble upon the future and they're able to take the innovation and, 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 and form it in their own way. So we're creating the platform to empower other people to actually run with it. And so for what what uh, at the core of Debrief, it's a it's a, a communication network that will empower people to do end to end communications uh, with we and we have a set of APIs and people can embed that in their products. They can test with it for demonstration purposes. Since I can't say okay, here's some middleware. Uh, we created an application that demonstrates some of the features and functionality that one could do, but it's more like this code will be available to other people to understand what we've done to encourage people to figure out what they what they can do. In the case of Zoom and others, I mean, the biggest challenge, Zoom, Zoom basically had a wish, I think, which was to become the most popular app on the internet. And it's like, be careful what you wish for, because when you wake <laughs> up one day and you are the most popular app ever on the, on the app store. Lots of scrutiny. You have a lot. Well, not only you have scrutiny, right? I mean, if you remember people- You're um, a big target play, too. You're targeted. If you remember people targeting uh, Cisco and all these routers because mm -hmm. people were having a home invasion of their Wi-Fi networks because people were not changing their default passwords. Yes, we're talking about about you you know product inter interface challenges. We're talking about usability issues and things that are on people's roadmap. I mean, the problem, the most of the issues that Zoom has or had is the fact that people, their customers, were not reading the fine manual. If we would say RTFM, I don't want to curse here, but but writing software myself, yes. we had so many customers looking for support. We would say RTFM, and they didn't know what RTFM stood for. So we said, it's for read the font, read the fine manual. Uh, <laughs> but most people are too rushed to get into something. And then a lot of events, particularly those that serve the public, they actually share the password. And people do the bombing, and they come in. They they yep. they, they 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 come into the they do the interruption. And yes, if if people have malice, if people have malintent, people will do bad things. Well, it's also it, stupidity, it, 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 and people it, do stupid things. Yes, they will. I mean, I was on a Zoom conference call with Eric Suffer, a uh, mobile expert, just a week ago, and we had two hundred people on, and it was going to be amazing. I mean, he 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 was VP of user acquisition at Rovio, right? I mean, he yeah. he he he's worked at Network. Uh, he sold his company to Network. The guy knows what he's talking about. We had all these experts on, and somebody bombed and started drawing dick pics the entire time. <laughs> And we be basically could not continue, could not proceed, right. right? I mean, you you just you just run out, so it's not possible. So we've seen these issues uh, with some of these platforms. And by the way, you're such a technologist, you jump right into the problem and the technology. And I think you mentioned the name of the new company once, <laughs> Debrief. So I oh, love that about you. Shirt. I, I should I should say it's, it's on my shirt, but, uh, <laughs> there but yeah, you so. go. excellent, excellent. So you're trying to fix that problem, and you're building a platform for well, it. Well, it's uh, a, it's a fix it as much as that actually be proactive about it. So the, the yes. idea is that, you know, my, my challenge right now is to find software developers, engineers, people who are creative, who would like to join the communication network of the future and who would like to play with a, a, blo a network, a blockchain communication network and join us and play. We, of course, we want people to commercialize their products, but I like to at least let them exploit the potential of what's there. We have a toolkit. I'm looking for feedback. I'm looking for user acquisition. We have, I think, Last I checked, 3,000 people were using what we created as a demonstration to showcase what we can do. Uh, and, and this is not a game. I'm trying to get to millions of people using my application. I'm what I mean, I 20 years ago when I was doing free world dial up, I advocated. I had a whole list on my website of all these devices you can connect to our network that you can use. And then I made this mistake, I, I believe, a good mistake, but I learned from it. But I plowed a lot of money into building my own app. I was silly enough to call it Pulver Communicator. I interoperated <laughs> all the instant messaging networks together. I had all these functions, all these features, and it was so complicated. Like the only person who was using, it, I think, was me. And I was like, "Oh, I don't want to do that again." So, but, but it but probably I, meant your need exactly. You <laughs> it probably meant your need exactly. <laughs> yeah, 
perfectly. And then when I woke up, I called these, my the developing team and like add this, add that, and like what? Um, but I, I pull back because I, I don't represent everybody, but I, I do need to be able to demonstrate capabilities. And if you look back to um, having end-to-end -end IP, which is key, so we're not phone number based, right? We're not. I'm not using the old world thinking. I'm not into the the mindset of telephone numbers as identification. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the thing about having a decentralized communication network is that we don't see the content or context of what's being shared. Yes. So you have privacy because it's a true peer-to-peer -peer communication network. You you will have onboarding. You will have a way of uh, creating a way for people to be identified uh, as one would in any type of network. But it, but it's most you know it is has it, it was built from the top down bottom up to be de as decentralized as possible so that we don't see the context of what's being shared and you have privacy in those communications yeah you said context but i think you mean content correct well both right because if, if, if you had content i could look and see what you're talking about and, and all of a sudden show advertisements based on what you're talking about yeah i mean yep. i find the whole thing creepy that you and i could be talking about um hats which is my hat from my podcast and, and if I talk about hats in about an hour from now, if I look at my smartphone, I'll start seeing commercials for hats because somehow someone is listening and hat <laughs> commercials start showing up. And it's too coincidental uh, for it not to be that someone is listening and all of a sudden showing me Panama hats. And so mm -hmm. it, it, it is just um, interesting to me. So so I'm looking to the future and looking at you know what one needs in order to have a, a, a vital, viable communication network. Mm -hmm. and, and so we're we're, we're looking to be, if you will, the next generation AT and T, the next generation mo uh, communication network. Yeah. And we're focusing just on Backbone. IP communications. I'm not saying whether you're mobile. Fit, uh, you know, there, it's really a mindset. And 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 and, and at the early stage that we're at, we've created the platform. We we need we need to find developers so we can get feedback to what we've created to understand. Gee, this is nice, but what about adding this feature? Yeah. Oh well, have you thought about that? And yeah. and 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 yes, we can support uh, open pro. There are protocols we can support on a technical level, but right now, from a from a person who's hearing about what we're doing perspective, we have the potential to onboard a lot of people and to create infrastructure that other people will benefit from as we learn and as we develop. We it, it is. I'm not saying we figured everything out. I don't think we ever figure everything out. But if you look at communication networks of yesterday. And where things will evolve into tomorrow, having the ability to have uh, secure end-to-end -end communication without um, somebody in between the endpoints is something which I think is interesting and needed and so, will be more used. So um, you've answered big chunks of that with where you've just talked right now, but uh, I'll be super honest with you. Um, as a journalist, when I'm pitched and somebody says they've got some new blockchain solution for X or something like that, what I often find is that people see the world. If they're a crypto person, they see everything as a crypto problem and they have a crypto solution for everything. If they're a blockchain person, they see everything as a blockchain problem and they, and they have a blockchain, blockchain solution for that. I, I don't consider myself a blockchain or crypto person. I, I live inside this matrix, which we have both. <laughs> uh, and, and, and in my case, the reason my, my original interest in blockchain communications was on the back office, trying mm -hmm. to solve billing challenges and reconciliations. Mm -hmm. uh, that mm -hmm. was the first entry of this. And I have a whole bunch of ideas on that. And then when I looked at how we start a, how we start a conversation and the, and the steps that one takes, Verification of endpoint, understanding who you're talking with, who you're communicating, who you're communicating with, and and understanding that is the person you want to be having the the conversational transaction, whether we're sharing thoughts, ideas, or something else. Yes, that's important. And and you also people want to sometimes have and be anonymous and autonomous, and we have other needs. So how do you onboard people? Give maintain their privacy and, and the integrity of their data. So, you know, in our case, by not storing what you're sharing, we're able to. Um, you know, the only people who have stuff that that was shared is the, the devices. We don't. We as a network don't have it. So, so we're not going to be able to share that with anyone else because we don't see it. 
The, so, the beauty, one of the beauties of that, I mean, is that companies are spending a lot of time, social networks are spending a lot of time right now uh, responding to requests for information, right, uh, by three-letter agencies. Yes. And uh, if you don't have it, uh, you can't provide it. Uh, there are other challenges that come with that. But what I want to ask you about is you're, you're building a platform um, and apps will run on that platform. In fact, you've said that Zoom itself could run on that platform. It, it could. Uh, it, 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 we're, we're, you know, if Zoom wanted to set up in their test bed uh, an a piece to take our code and, and, and use our code to uh, do a startup a session, they could. Uh, talk about I, a little I, bit about I, I, how that process would work. Well, there we'll keep it simple because I can get very technical. I don't. Yes, want to you can. People here. <laughs> uh, but if we, we, if anyone learned how to write code, eventually they 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 write a program that says "Hello World." Yes. And you compile it, or you you see it. And I have written a number of concept. those programs. Very sophisticated "Hello World" programs. Yeah. So we've created uh, a nice demonstration of what one could do today based on on the specifics of our network. If somebody on the Zoom team or somebody on some other team would like to play and and get hold of the toolkit, we are on GitHub. They can go on the GitHub. They can download the APIs and they could play. And they let us. They'll let us. They'll let us, us know whether they can play or not. I mean, my assumption is that we're open enough for them to wrap what we have inside what they're using and get value from what we've created. But they need to tell us. I, I've not seen their source code. I don't know what they've done. I don't know what, what architectures they have. I, I'm, you know, it's an assumptive guess that we could be a value to everyone at mm -hmm. some level. We could be. Yeah. Uh, if, if Zoom's interested in what we're doing, we can certainly have a business conversation with them. But the Good. the 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 idea though is the architecture. There's they, they they were created with telephone numbers in mind. Even if we don't use telephone numbers to come into a video Zoom, a lot of people are identified based on their cell telephone number. So that. My belief is, at least at the beginning, they were they they were central office focused. They were centralized mm -hmm. focused. Mm -hmm. They they had a an architecture that's centralized, not decentralized, mm -hmm. and that's a mindset. Mm -hmm. We used to call that the bell heads versus the net heads. Uh, look, the most the most popular decentralized application on the internet today is DNS. The mm -hmm. fact that domain name services can be all over the world, and and when one goes down, the other one all the others stay up. It's just magical. So mm -hmm. having decentralized communications in uncertain times is something which we all need, I believe. And I think that we all want to have a backup way to communicate. Uh, you know, I, voice, I, I, it's, I, yes, I, I know in the COVID-19 days, it doesn't sound good, but voice is a killer app. No, it's not going to kill you. But in times <laughs> of uncertainty, in times of need, in times of greatness, we want to share and talk and communicate with somebody, with a loved one and the emotion that's built into the voice um, is, 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 is priceless. So, let's so. let's talk a little bit about scalability. Um, the um, uh, we've seen huge challenges with scalability across the globe in the Completely. last month or so, right? Uh, Zoom itself, which we've been talking about on and off, uh, went went twenty x more. I mean, it, it, amazing growth. Microsoft Teams, uh, huge growth, right? Uh, pretty much every cloud based application and communication app is growing right now. Uh, so blockchain is not super well known for scalability. There's been a lot of advances in the past year on that. Talk to us a little bit about scalability and the platform that you're building. Well, I, I'm, I'm not writing any of the code, so I'm dealing with the developers that are creating this. Uh, right now, we, I've not seen any challenges about being able to handle the transactions that we have based on the users that, users that we have. Uh, can we, and we're not, you know, a, this is its own dedicated blockchain. We're not dealing with any um, public blockchains. This is just within our network. And we're using the, the, the fuel, the technology that blockchain represents, the actual essence of it, to do what we believe it's designed for. I mean, at the at the at a high level, blockchain is a database. Yes. And, and so we're using it very simply, uh, without the overhead that you know that that other public blockchains have. If what we have isn't good enough because we we have too many users, I imagine they will rearchitect it in a way that's more scalable. It may be by geography, maybe by user types. I don't know, but it, mm -hmm. it's not something mm -hmm. which I, I am not saying that we're we're flying airplanes at a with a with a you know billion transactions per second. We have a speed of light issue there. Yes, this, this is not about a high speed network. This is about creating a communication network so that it's optimized for the environment that it's operating in, and focused specifically on it, which happens to be slow. We don't need speed. I mean, of course, you want speed. Uh, but we have Moore's law in our favor in the sense that you know the, comp the compute time continues still to get faster. It still evolves. 
and I'm not a, that has not, to date, speed has not been an issue with our ability to build and create and to talk to people interested in working with us. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's it's not on the table as one of the, no one has identified that as a challenge other than I would bring it up and say, gee, are we fast enough? And then I can realize, wait, (laughs) we don't have too many computes to do here. uh, So we're good enough for now. And, And when we grow, uh, we'll deal with it. I had similar stuff uh, with FWD. We ended up having to do load balancing. We ended up having to have to, to decentralize, but centralize how we were handling it. And and, and we uh, more than once we rebuilt everything from the ground up. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's it's just crazy. But you know, when you're when you're flying like that, when you're, if you're zooming right, and all of a sudden you wake up and you become the most popular app on creation because you happen to have the platform of the day that's interoperable works across multiple operating systems, multiple devices, and people go to it for video. Um, first of all, most of those people are probably not paying for that service. Mm-hmm. So, and, mm-hmm. and, and and Zoom probably is not able to capture revenue from most of those people because they're there for under 40 minutes and they're in and they're out and they're not being, but but at the same time, they're making they're making a life on this planet better. So yeah. I, I appreciate the humanitarian, uh, humanitar- human, humanitarian. humanitarian ability of Zoom to add value. And and I appreciate that. And in terms of security stuff, I mean, most of the security break-ins we've seen in the past was based on people's uh, uh, unintentional consequences of not changing default passwords. I mean, that, if yeah. you talk to anyone who does security, that's like the top stuff is don't don't leave the word, don't leave the sample passwords in there. <laughs> don't do that. Um, and in the case of Zoom, it was really the onboarding process. I'm sure someone in the product team wanted to make onboarding as fast as possible. Yes. But simplified it. Yes. But they didn't expect, trust me, if they were planning on being the most popular app on the planet, they if they had a chance to do have a do-over, there are other people who would have advocated, I would love to do it this way. Yes. They just didn't have that chance. And so now they're being reactive rather than proactive. I have complete confidence that Zoom and many other people in that world will do well. But you know, why? what happened to Skype, right? It doesn't have to be only team. What about Google, right, with Hangouts? It's it's now, you know, me, it, it, they, there's this technology is, 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 is not rare, right? But it's the context and how we approach it and how we think collectively that adds value to this. Why is it that you have better audio on this production than the news than the people doing new, live broadcast news in New York City? Yes. When people working in their home offices, their audio is not so good. Yeah, yeah. It's funny. little context here. I just shared on Twitter. I was actually watching one of the sports news stations. I live in Vancouver, Canada. And so I was watching TSN. Um, and, and all the sportscasters are in their own home offices or living rooms or whatever. And they have horrible audio. And this is broadcast TV. Millions of dollars spent. They could get the best technology. I've got a USB mic right here. <laughs> the right. Rode Podcaster plugged into my laptop. And, it works and I'm going right. out with StreamYard. And the audio is actually really, really good. And, and, and we don't see that in others. We have a question from the audience here. I'm just going to put it up on the screen from Jeremy Randall uh, watching on YouTube. He says, hey, Jeff, where do you see decentralized communication apps in five years? Uh, five years is a long time uh, and a lot can change. But uh, do you have some thoughts on that? Well, I, I think that we probably won't be calling it decentralized communication apps. That within five the years... Apps? No, it's going to, it's going to change. I mean, we're still in a web 1.x mindset in terms of how we're doing things. I think that we have paradigm changes Uh, and and that, you know, I, when I was running, doing a lot of work in the era of, of uh, AI and uh, and conversational voice interfaces, I believe that apps went away and I believe that web pages went away. I believe that we're, you know, how much time is wasted trying to do using search. Like we, we as humans were very inefficient when we go on a website, I mean, it's the same comment I make to people. It's like, don't tell me about e-commerce, drop the E, you're in the commerce business. It's been 20 years since that <laughs> happened. So in terms of what, what happens with communication apps, 20, you know, five years from now, I would like to believe that we have to, an ability to be understood, whether it's us or it's our conversational agent that's representing us, that we have a bot, if you will, that is who we are, that, ha- that has our voice, that understands our phonemes, and uh, it will evolve, you know, we, as we get the better ability to have high compute power, um, we can define and create anything we want to. It's just a matter of who we are, what the application needs are, and what the design requirements are. But I have great uh, faith in our ability to continue to innovate. But at the end of the day, being able to see somebody, being able to pick up and talk to somebody, 
that is still priceless. I think five years from now, voice will remain the uh, killer, quote unquote, killer app, but the the number one way of communicating. And, and it's no surprise to me that under the in the days of of, of, of COVID-19, that the telephone has once again become a popular way for people to communicate. You know, uh, one thing I'll add to that, um, and I think video is a big piece that 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 we can add to that. And I know you've done that and and and, and believe that as well. Um, I was talking, I was being interviewed by somebody the other day. I, I had to answer the questions in that case, not just ask them. So I had the harder job, which you have today. But um, and and we were talking about what's changed, what technology has changed with coronavirus, with COVID nineteen. And I said, you know, I had, I owned a, uh, a Facebook portal and, and I sold it after three months. I do that with a lot of technology. I buy stuff, use it, eh, sell it, you know, at a big loss, my wife gets mad at me. Um, but what I wish I had right now and what I liked about the Facebook portal was sort of ambient presence yes. where I could kind of, uh, call my mom. And it wasn't like calling her. It wasn't an event. It wasn't a hold a device in my hand type of scenario. The right? device is there. You're connecting. Yes, You're connecting it just to was the there. Room. And so yeah. we could just do that. And I want something like that. I want a, a big screen on the wall in my dining room that I don't watch TV on, but I just call my mom and say, hey, we're having dinner. You want to have dinner with us? And we have dinner like we're in the same place almost, but you know, you just have a conversation. Well, the good news That's is I like. Companies like Cisco created that um, tech over 20 years ago. Yes. I've, I've seen demonstrations of that. You, you've also seen the 3D holograms. Um, we're, I don't know whether it's five years from now or not, but we, we will be able to project ourselves almost as good as the folks at um, International, uh, at the uh, at um, George Lucas's. Uh, um, Industrial Light and Magic? Yes. Those folks are able to do it on the big screen. We'll be, be able to do have actual real tech that does it. In that particular case, uh, you know, shout out to George Lucas for showing the way of how things will evolve. But I do, I do believe that if you look at all the clients of Industrial Light and Magic, both on the Marvel side and and, and on the DC side, DC Comics side, yes. a lot of the sci-fi that we've seen uh, has share, provided a showcase for where three D um, interactive three D uh, holographic images will go. And if you Saw 60 Minutes recently last week with uh, with the work that's being done to capture, um, I believe it was people who were in, in the Holocaust and being able to create an interactive model where you can actually wow. talk to somebody. I think they captured 2,000 questions. Um, and uh, it was very surreal because they had a, both an interview with someone who's p recently passed away and people who are still alive interviewing themselves. And it was like, wow. And and, and the emotion and and and, and seeing and, and the actual projection, it's there. So... So we're in the infancy of that future now. So we took, and, and that's all part of this communication experience. I mean, for me, and you alluded to this at the beginning of the show, I've been in the communications industry ever since I discovered amateur radio. Yes. Uh, uh, for me, ham radio was my cure for loneliness. I grew up uh, in Queens, uh, in New York, but I did not have too many friends or the friends I had, I didn't really connect so much with. And thanks to my uncle, one of my uncles, I was able to discover amateur radio because he had one. And that's been my life quest. It took me a couple of years to learn that I was when you're nine years old and having to teach yourself college level physics, it takes a little time. But I, <laughs> I, I got over the hump and I, I, I got the license and I and I'm back in the hobby. Uh, oddly enough, about six months ago, I I jumped back into amateur radio and um, I'm now playing with technologies that literally are being used for interstellar space communication. And that's where my passions are, too. I've 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 looked a lot into that future, and um, it all deals with different elements of communication. And it's uh, it's how we communicate, how we connect, how we're able to converse with others that will define who who we are. I love that. I absolutely love that. I mean, one of the questions that I had for you is that you've accomplished a ton. You built a lot of companies. You've invested in more than four hundred startups. You were an early investor in Twitter. A lot of people who have accomplished or could accomplish something along the lines of what you've done would be on a beach somewhere, maybe in the Bahamas, maybe in Jamaica, uh, somewhere, and relaxing with their feet up and uh, calling for the Mai Tais, right? Uh, that's not you. Uh, no, I, talk about why. Well, I would, I would say that if it was a location in the world that had uh, did not have light pollution, and it was uh, when the new when it was a new moon and not a full moon. You'd see me out um, if if it's not cloudy under the stars, looking up into the galactic center of the Milky Way, 
I have a great appreciation for the galaxy and for the galaxies around us, and I spent a lot of time doing astrophotography. I discovered that was one of my passions about six years ago, and I I, I don't let go of that. And by the way, if you don't follow Jeff on Twitter yet, uh, you need to, at Jeff Pulver. He shares some of those images there as well as on Facebook, and they're amazing. Thank you, and I I will answer that. I get bored easily. So (laughs) that is why I I, I am – I get bored and I, but I also, with my hobbies, they're obsessions. You know, it's like, I don't know how to do something in moderation. I, I go all in, even if I just want to go a little bit in, if I'm really into something, I go all in. I am the person in my freshman year in college. I had, I got made Dean, I made Dean's list by having four A's and a D. It just, it's, it, it, <laughs> it is who I am. And, 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 and so. You um, sound like my son, who's a third year engineering student at UVC. I mean, he's got straight A's or, or extremely good grades, except for English. <laughs> C minus. Yeah, yeah but we, it works out okay. It turns out okay. It's so, so where we go with this, and, and so, so I, my mind is different than other people's minds. I like to be, uh, uh, I like to have an opportunity to, to explore and to create and to innovate and to, to challenge. And if if, it, if it's meant to be on a beach, so be it. Uh, but I, I have I have just I even when I was healing from bad accidents, I, I couldn't relax. I, I it yeah. is it is a challenge. I, I have a hard time letting go. But if I let go, I'll let go completely and just go on a digital uh, <laughs> debrief. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just let I let go. And uh, but so so for me. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to, to challenge the status quo, to to look at the future and to be part of it and help to at least suggest where things may go. Uh, I learn, you know, I learn from what works and sometimes we're too early. Uh, a lot of the startups I invested in were either too early or just didn't happen and others happen greatly. And mm-hmm. I, I am, a, uh, I, I have no regrets for being an early stage investor. I, I, I believe in people. I, I believe in the evolution of tech. And I, and I, and I know that we will get through the, the world that we're in. There is a tomorrow. It's different than yesterday. And I've learned to be in the, the, the now. I think the, the hardest part people have who haven't figured this out yet is to be in the state of now. Yeah. To let go of the attachment to the way things were and to yeah. accept themselves in the world they're in yeah. and breathe. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, then, exactly. and then we're able to go forward together as one. And if there was ever a time for the world to unite, it's now. Now is the it's time. Right. We, yeah, it's like we need the Avengers. We need to work together as one to get through this, and we will. And magic will continue to happen along the way. Let's um, then take that as inspiration for where we end. A lot of people are asking, what's the first thing that you're going to do after coronavirus? And that's a really tough one because, frankly, um, there, there's probably not going to be a clean after coronavirus. I mean, unless we get a vaccine magically in the next little while and magically it gets, um, distributed to everyone on the planet very, very quickly. Uh, but let's say that we're back at some new normal in six months, uh, maybe four months. If we're really lucky, maybe 12 months or longer. I don't know, but a new normal when you can travel and other things like that. What are you looking forward to doing? to never forgetting how grateful we all should be to the people who took care of us now, to everyone on the front lines, that the people who are just doing their job and saving lives should not be forgotten, the people who've died doing their jobs and everyone who's doing everything possible to make all those ecosystems run, the, the doctors and nurses, the emergency workers, the policemen, the firemen, as well as people going to doing their jobs at work and running the grocery stores, providing gas, providing infrastructure, everybody needs not to be forgotten. Because it's because of them we're going to be able to get out of this and go forward. That is what I hope we do not forget. Because frankly, when I've had, when I've overcome sicknesses, my mind is such that I forget about the pain, I forget about the agony, I forget about what I went through being in a hospital, dealing with all this stuff, and I look forward and I let go, and I'm able to do that. And when we don't feel well for some reason, I think we're able to let go of how we felt, and we're in that we're feeling good now. I don't ever want to forget the people who are putting themselves on the front line. I used to work at the World Trade Center. I'm very grateful that I wasn't that I didn't die on 9/11 because I had the kind of job that if I wasn't fired from it, I would have very well could have perished. I do not ever want to forget um, everyone who's putting themselves out to help the rest of us. That that needs not to be forgotten. So that's number one. 
that needs to be underlined. That really needs to be underlined. And I'm just going to add to that for a second. Um, there was a, a UK prime minister, uh, UK member of parliament recently who said in this day, isn't the guy who picks up the garbage have, doesn't he have, or she have more social utility than the investment banker. And, and, you know, whether that's investment banker, whether that, whatever that is, white collar job, the people who are putting groceries on the shelves, the people who are selling that, I mean, those people are putting their lives on the line as well. And they are coming down with COVID-19 at greater levels, higher proportions than the rest of society. And those people who are delivering UPS, FedEx, all those other people, uh, it really is amazing. So uh, kudos to that. Agree. And sorry, back to you. Uh, and I would just add that one, what, one local business that I think will go hyper local is the return of the uh, milkman. I believe that people that, that we're going to actually appreciate having our local perishables delivered to us, not so much through these mainstream big VC invested companies, but local people delivering groceries to their neighbors, I think is something which is retro, but will come back. So whether we're delivering eggs and milk and other dairy products or what we need, the bare essentials, I think don't be surprised to see certain neighborhoods pop up with the, the quote unquote milkman, mm -hmm. whatever it will be called in 2020. But it's, mm -hmm. it's, I, I think that we will see a need to better connect with our communities and serve each other Mm -hmm. uh, and I, mm -hmm. I am uh, uh, I'm just, you know, just watching this go by. I also am grateful to all the musicians and artists that are coming online right now yes. and creating spontaneous concerts, people that are sharing their passions with us just so we feel better. I don't know what Bruce Springsteen is doing to feel better, but I'm grateful that he went on Cirrus and he and she shared a live, live concert. You're seeing Broadway. You're seeing all these TV actors. You're seeing all these wonderful spontaneous concerts happening um, and, and they're sharing. And it's like... Uh, and one thing about the arts is that, you know, if you wrote a song 35 years ago and you've been famous for that song for 35 years, you've been singing it for all these years. It's not like <laughs> nobody wants to hear your new stuff. They just want to hear what you did 35 years ago. Can you imagine that, that you wrote a story 35 years ago and all you could do every time you do an interview is read that story? Yes, like, yes, ah! yes, yes, yes. So <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, um, go ahead. No, I, I thank you for the chance to communicate. I, I, I am uh, grateful for the opportunity to connect and to be part of your, um, to be a guest here and to connect with your audience. And really, it's, it's, uh, these are interesting times. And I, I, I know we will get through this. And we just have to allow ourselves to breathe and to be present and to let go and to let go of the attachment to yesterday and not worry. I mean, we will get through this. We will get through this. And uh, no, we're not living in a sci-fi movie. This is real life. This is happening now. And I am positive we will break through this. And I'm not worried about yesterday. I, we just deal with the now. Well, I want to thank Jeff for being with us on this show and on this podcast. Uh, when you have Jeff on, then uh, you don't just get the technical know-how and the insight and what's new and what's exciting. You also get a lot of the heart and the soul of somebody who feels and thinks deeply. If you've been with us, thank you for joining us on Tech First. My name is John Kutsir. I appreciate you being along for the ride. It's wonderful. Whatever platform you're on, please like, subscribe, share, whatever you like. If you're on the podcast listening later on, please rate it, review it, especially if you like it. That'd be a massive help. Until next time, this is John Kutsir with Tech First.